I'm next up, uh, and I'm going to be speaking to you all about proximal tibia, extraarticular deformities, the indications and techniques. The learning goals that I have for everybody are first to, to understand what the indications are, and they're a little different than many of the earlier uh, uh, topics we've hit in this course. Uh, and then I want to discuss whether what I was taught as a resident and what many still believe, which is that if you're in varus, you need a high tibial osteotomy, whether that's true, and if it's not, why not? The third thing I'd like to discuss a little bit like Mauricio did, I want to discuss why biplanar osteotomy versus uniplanar. And then finally, we'll go over some surgical tips. Many of the indications in this course so far have involved techniques to obtain union and correct gross malalignment for function. When we start talking about the extra articular areas around the knee, the most frequent use of the high tibial osteotomy really is as a joint preserving procedure for patients with some osteoarthritis that is hopefully somewhat focal, where you can potentially do a joint preserving operation. I'd like to give you a case example of uh, where these indications may play out. And so this is a patient of mine. He's a 66-year-old male, and he is extraordinarily active still and was very active throughout his life. Prior commander of Delta Force twice, had a 35-plus year history uh, of uh, military service, really active. And on the side, his wife had had a total knee that did not go well, so he's adamant that he does not want a knee replacement. Uh, he had a prior open supracondylar femur fracture on the same side with a vascular injury from a mortar blast. And his pain is overwhelmingly medial, even though he does have some degree of tricompartmental arthritis. So here's what his knees look like. You can see he's got varus on both sides, but it's significantly worse on that right side where you can get a feel for the supracondylar femur fracture that had occurred once as well. So First question is, is he a candidate for osteotomy? And again, in, in many cases, a lot of people would think total knee, but this patient is absolutely adamant he's not going to go there. And he is still, even with this degree of deformity, incredibly active. So he's got some degree of bilateral tricompartmental arthritis, but it is clearly worse in the medial side. Uh, bilateral varus deformity and then severe post-traumatic right lower extremity. It's a complex situation, complicated a little bit more by that earlier fracture. You can see his uh, weight bearing is way medial. So does he meet the indications? And, and, and the answer is that with what he wishes to accomplish in life, even though he's 66, he's physiologically much younger and he's, and he's uh, again, not ready for a total knee at this point. So planning is really critical. Again, if it's varus, it must be a high tibial osteotomy, right? And the answer is yes and no. He clearly had an abnormal medial uh, proximal tibial angle but if you tried to address this entire deformity only with that, you would create an oblique joint. And I'm, I'm afraid earlier in my career, I've done this a number of times. Because what you can see is that his lateral distal femoral angle is also abnormal. So the only way you can address him is doing a double level osteotomy with a lateral femoral closing wedge and a medial tibial opening wedge. So here's what it looked like when we did that. And we were able to get him uh, a nice correction that got him down the middle. He had substantial pain relief at one year and he's now two years out. He unfortunately uh, is a very active and aggressive guy and he got too active and aggressive and broke the medial hardware, but had his full correction maintained on the femoral side and part of it on the medial side and still has not undergone a total knee and is re re remaining with his active lifestyle. So that's indications. What about the idea of varus deformity always requires a high tibial osteotomy? I'd like to show you another case. This is a patient of mine that's 33 years old, extremely active female, but multiple prior surgeries for post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Ended up having biologic replacement of both the medial and lateral compartments. And I don't want to concentrate on that. I want to concentrate on the alignment issues. This is what her alignment films look like. And what you can see here is that she's in quite a bit of varus and we, we can't allow that to stay that way and expect for that medial compartment uh, biologic replacement to survive. So does she need a high tibial osteotomy? Your initial thought would be probably so. She's in quite a bit of varus. But when you do the planning, and this is the MediCAD software that we use, um, and, and uh, it shows that her proximal tibial angle is actually normal. It's her lateral distal femoral angle that's abnormal. So even though she's in varus, if you were to try to treat this and get her Michaelis alignment appropriate by doing a tibial osteotomy, 
uh, that, that was an opening wedge, like most people would think, you would end up with severe obliquity of the joint and she would do very poorly. On the other hand, we went and did a distal femoral osteotomy. You can see it's 11 millimeters to get this correct. And what she ended up with is an 87 degree lateral distal femoral uh, angle to go with the 87 degree proximal tibial angle. So it's very important to understand that it doesn't automatically mean you need a high tibial osteotomy when you're in varus. This is showing a little bit on that case. You can see I'm trying to protect my hinge. Everything's looking good, closing it down, hinge is still looking good. And then I did an extremely stupid thing and put a cortical screw above and I broke the hinge. So we've got a nice correction, but I've got a broken hinge. And, and an important thing to know on the femur, and we'll talk about this in a second, is if you break the hinge on the, on the uh, distal femur, you need to seriously consider placing a second plate because if you don't, you can easily lose that correction. You can see where we ended up with it right down the middle, which is where we wanted it so that we're protecting both the medial and lateral sides. So don't create a joint that's oblique to the floor. The planning's absolutely critical for success. And like I said, I'm sorry to say that earlier in my career, I've done that more than once and it doesn't work. Okay, what about biplanar osteotomies? Mauricio gave a fantastic discussion of this for the distal femur. And I think that it's very important and all of my training had been in uniplanar. So this is something, again, I learned later in my career. But what's the reason? Why would you want to do this proximal tibia? One reason is it, it very much improves your ability to adjust correction, both the coronal and sagittal plane. So yes, with a uniplanar, you can make a little correction on your slope, but you can make a much bigger and better correction if you need to by doing the biplanar. Second reason is you have a lot better stability due to much increased surface area because of that, that cut anteriorly and then faster healing due to that increased bony surface area. So you can get the idea with this of that increased surface area that allows you to hopefully heal more quickly and be much more stable where you're not gonna lose it in the sagittal plane. Let's talk real quickly about some surgical tips. Uh, you wanna do a medial approach generally for the proximal tibial osteotomy. Preserve the PES tendons. There are, there are different plates that are designed to protect them and, and there's just no need to take them out. Um, use a Kirshner wire to guide your cut and make sure it's an oblique orientation. You wanna aim with your, your, your cut to take, hit the tip of the fibula. Uh, uh, Professor Lobenhofer says that you wanna knock the hat off the top of the fibula and he, he always draws a little hat on the top there. So you wanna hit right to that tip. Don't cut the lateral cortex. You wanna preserve that and make sure the knee's flexed for your posterior cut so that you don't put the neurovascular structures at risk. Again, for me, I strongly believe now in a biplanar cut, and you can see kind of the drawing there to show what that angle should be in order to make that cut. And then you want to open your osteotomy very slowly and progressively to avoid fracturing that lateral hinge. Uh, the the uh, Tomofix set, which is specifically designed for tibial osteotomies, has five osteotomes in it. And if you can place those sequentially and slowly, here you see three of them placed in, it'll very slowly open up your osteotomy. Now, you don't have to have that set. You don't have to use those plates in order to do this. But if you can get a set of osteotomes, you can accomplish the same thing. But it's a very slow process to open it so that you preserve that hinge. And then you exchange those osteotomes for lamina spreader like this and measure exactly from your preoperative planning how much you want to open it. And then you're all set. You want to stabilize the osteotomy with a plate. Any larger plate that's 4.5 or bigger can be used. There are sets like this one here that, that uh, are specifically designed for it uh, and, and make it probably a little bit easier because they're anatomically designed and they're really for that. Um, this will heal without grafting. And so you don't have to put in any graft. I do like to add bone marrow aspirate concentrate and allograft just to speed the healing process so I can let my patients get going with weight bearing earlier, but it, it will heal without it if you don't want to do that and save some money. That's an example of the system we use to get the bone marrow aspirate concentrate. What happens if you do break the hinge? So if you're doing that proximal osteotomy, if you break the hinge like that black line I just showed into the tib fib joint, it's generally stable and you don't usually need to do an open reduction internal fixation on the other side, on the lateral side. So you can just manage it conservatively, maybe go a little bit short, slower with your uh, a weight bearing, but you don't have to do anything else. If, on the other hand, you break the hinge above the tib-fib joint, either into the joint or proximal to the tib-fib joint, at this point now, you really need to plate that laterally as well, or it's, you're going to lose your stability. What about the distal femur? 
if you break that hinge, like I showed you, it tends to be unstable and you really need to plate it on the other side. Okay, so what is, what's the summary I would tell you? First, the indications most frequently involve joint preservation with post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Planning's critical. Varus does not automatically equal a high tibial osteotomy. And bioplanar osteotomies have many advantages. Finally, know the technique tips. If you're wondering how, how do these fit into my toolbox of handling post-traumatic osteoarthritis, for me, it's an, an issue really of physiologic age. So when I state ages, I'm really talking about physiologic age. Some older people are, are really physiologically younger and vice versa. And what does that patient desire to do over the next decade? So for me, if you're greater than 60 physiologic age and you're really ready to slow down, that patient's really ready for a total knee arthroplasty and that's the way you should go. If on the other hand, the patient's between 50 and 65, roughly again, physiologic age, not calendar, and wants to stay pretty active and has a compartment that's in decent shape, that's your patient who really can benefit from the osteotomy and, and uh, it, it can make a huge difference. And I will tell you, I've personally had a distal femur osteotomy. And first of all, I admire that guy Mauricio who had it with no anesthesia because it was a whack with anesthesia. <laughs> so that guy was tough. Uh, but, but it's a great move if you want to stay active and have a compartment that you can work with. And if you're less than 60 ish physiologic age and you want to stay really active, then consider biologic replacement. Thanks very much.